So if you want to build a fast gaming computer and you don't want to spend too much money on a brand new i9 9900KF then using two 8 year old Xeon processors that you can get for less than half the price might be a good way to go. So in this video we're going to build the dual Xeon system, do a bunch of benchmarks and play some games and see if it performs well and compare it to the i9 and some Ryzen AMD CPUs. We're going to use CPU Z to test out the CPU performance, both single threaded and multi threaded. And right away we can see here that the dual Xeon build gives you 11% faster performance than the Intel i9 9900KF. Unfortunately, single core performance is only 59% of the KF. So you'll want to go with the newer CPU if you want to have better overall performance. But if most of your tasks are multi threaded, like rendering and the newer games, then the Xeon will be a good budget build that will give you the power of a 9900KF. We're going to break this video up into two parts. The first part, we'll compare it to some Ryzen's and the i9's. And then in the second part, we'll do a before and after comparison of the system upgrade. For $362, you can have yourself a dual Xeon system that gives you 1,631 user benchmark points. So the Xeon gives you great performance per dollar compared to the i9. And it sort of makes sense when you look at their MSRP when they were first launched. The Xeon's would have been $3,500 for just the two CPUs. And now you can get them for about $50 each, or free as e-waste when they're decommissioning servers. So it's not too far-fetched that it can beat out the brand new i9, at least for multi-threaded applications. We'll take a look at the single-threaded later. The 8-year-old Xeons also beat out the Ryzen 3700, which is a $555 system. If you want real power, and you have $715 or $965, then that 2,772 user benchmark points will be very beneficial for your system. Last month, Intel released the 10th generation of the i9. If you can get your hands on the 10900K, you'll have a fast system. But a lot of places are out of stock right now, and some people are trying to flip it for three times the MSRP. From the test scores that have been posted to user benchmark, the single core performance is 6% better than the 9900KF, and the multi-core performance is 36% due to the faster single core performance and also because it has 10 cores instead of 8. Once it's back in stock, the pricing should be around the same as the Ryzen 3950, but obviously the 3950 has a much better multi-core performance. So you'll want to go with that if you want the highest performance. And if you take a look at the pricing, you can see right away that the Xeon is 22 cents per user benchmark score, so it's giving you the best bang for the buck. And the Intel is way up there at 54 cents. And then the Ryzen 3900 is 34 cents, and the 3950 is just slightly more at 35 cents. So I think it's worth it if you want the extra performance. Then the i9-10900 is sitting in between the Ryzen and the 9900KF. So it's worth it if you can find it. So now with the 10th generation i9, the i9 has the fastest single core performance at 152. The 9th generation is closely behind it at 144, and then all the Ryzen's are pretty similar at 136, 137 all of which are a lot higher than the Xeon 69 since it's running at a lower clock rate and because of its older architecture and technology. So you will see a overall performance increase with the newer CPUs since not all applications can use 32 threads. So if you want to save some money and build a budget computer, it can still be very powerful with 32 threads and great multi-core performance. Here's a quick look at the Cinebench R20 benchmarks. It's more representative of real world performance since the faster chipsets and RAM will give the i9 and the Ryzen's better performance. I'm running DDR3 at 1333 MHz and those systems can run DDR4 at 3600 MHz. So the newer systems will have an edge, but for 249 bucks, 32 gigs of 1600 MHz RAM is pretty good. So if you hunt around on AliExpress, you can find some pretty good deals. This one's on sale for 250 and you get actually a faster processor than what I'm using. And you get also 32 gigs of 1600 MHz RAM. So if you can snag one of these deals, you'll get pretty good performance, better than what I got, for cheaper. I'll leave some links in the description to some deals that I find. And you can search on AliExpress to find better deals every week. You can also find kits that have 64 gigs of RAM, 1866 MHz and also a 12 core CPU, the 2696 V2. I'd probably pay that little bit extra to get the 64 gigs of RAM and the more cores because I do a lot of video editing and that'll help. I think user benchmark is a good benchmark to run on your CPU or computer because it's free, easy to access, you just go to the website and run it. it does all sorts of tests. You can compare it to how the other systems out there perform and see how well your computer is doing. So as we saw before, the single core performance is not very good at 69. And since the 9900KF has 16 threads, 8 cores, the Xeon is only going to get ahead if you have more than 16 threads running. 
So with the 64 core test, you get 1631 beating out the 9900 KF and KS. Here's a table of the previous graph with the addition of percentages on the right. You can see that the E5 only gives you half the performance when you're running things that only use 1 to 8 cores. But then it gives you 10% greater performance for anything that's multi-core, like rendering videos or playing the latest games that are meant to utilize all the cores. And of course, the same thing applies to the Ryzen 3700, 3900, and 3950. They have 8 cores, which is the same as the 9900, 12 cores, and 16 cores with 32 threads. So if you need that extra performance, the 3900 and 3950 are the way to go. But the E5 is still a good budget build because it's faster performance than the 3700. So it's still a good build if you want to build a fast computer like a 3700, but for a budget price. If you have to have an Intel system, then the new 10th Gen 10900 is definitely the way to go. Faster single core performance than anything else and pretty fast multi-core performance. I use Hynix 1333, but you can get 1600 if you want. It supports it. So here are the two E5 2680s that I got. They're V1s, and I'd recommend getting the V2 with 10 cores if you find a cheap package with that. I got a server motherboard, but I don't recommend getting that because it didn't have sound or a USB 3.0 front header. It was meant for server use, so it doesn't really have the features that you'd like, like fan speed control, user adjustments without using jumpers, things like that. So if you get one of those kits with a fully loaded motherboard, you won't have to buy a separate sound card or USB card. And I have to warn you, be very careful with the pins on the motherboard. If you touch them, you'll destroy them. So install it all very carefully and very slowly. Here's a look at my old system and then my new system with the two huge CPU heatsinks. If you buy all the parts separately from AliExpress and Amazon, it should cost you around $362. So the Xeon system will give you about 55% savings and give you the same multi-core performance as the 9900 KF system. And compared to the AMD, which is usually good bang for your buck, it's 35% savings with similar multi-core performance. The 3900 and the 12 cores performs better than the Xeon, but it does cost twice as much. So for half the price, it's giving you pretty good performance compared to a 3900. The 16 cores of the 3950, it performs a lot better than the Xeon, but you're almost paying triple. So if you need that extra performance, you have to pay that premium. So now you know where all that pricing comes from and how it performs in 1 to 8 threads or 64 thread operations. I don't need good single core performance, I need good multi core performance. So the Xeon system is the perfect build for me. I do play some games and it does perform pretty well with those. Be hopeful that it uses up all the cores, but based on the programming, it's not always going to use all that. So if you look at Apex Legends, it uses partial of about 18 cores, but a lot of them are more utilized than the others. So faster single core performance will be beneficial for gaming. So based on my system performance, and cost comparisons to the Intel and AMD systems, I'd recommend getting the packages or buying the parts separately. I'd recommend getting a faster E5 or the V2 because they'll give you that extra performance. And if there's packages for 64 or 128 gigs of RAM, I'd go for that too because you can never have too much RAM. So now we'll take a look at the upgrade I made from the FX8350 to the E5 2680 and we'll get to see the difference in performance I got. So here's the old system, the AMD and the 16 gigabytes. This processor here, it's got eight cores. I'm gonna upgrade to dual eight core CPUs. So we should be getting 32 threads and 16 cores instead of eight cores here. To do the upgrade, we're gonna use Rufus here to create a UEFI bootable GMT drive. If you don't do it here and you do it in your BIOS, it won't take. So make sure you use Rufus to create a good drive with Windows 10 on it so that you can use the UEFI boot system. I use the Silent 601 case. It has a lot of sound editing material, so it keeps it nice and quiet for when I'm recording. For the flashlight fans out there, if you're looking for a good headlight to work on your computer, check out the Sofern SP40. It's been my go-to headlamp, and it's because it's USB chargeable, and it has a very good comfortable mount with three straps, so it stays in place when you're working around your computer. It comes with a pretty good Sofern battery. I definitely recommend it. I've tested this thing to have a lumen output of 1,393. That is a lot from one XPO LED, and that's at 3,000 Kelvin. So it can be even more if you use a cool color temperature. It has four modes. Low, medium, high, and to get to turbo, you double click. So this upgrade's gonna be based on this server motherboard. It's got the CPUs really close together, so it's gonna be hard to get large heat sinks on there. But if they're actually 125 watts each, this little tiny heat sink is not gonna work. So I've got these huge CPU coolers, and then at 100%, it's gonna run pretty cool with pretty slow fan speeds. There's three 
pulse width modulated fans on there so it can speed it up or slow it down. And hopefully the software can manage that. There's four of them per CPU. That's how they've configured it so that each CPU can run with its own RAM and then work together. We've got 20 grams of Arctic MX4. Plenty to spread on those two CPUs. I wanted my CPUs to run cool and my fans to run quiet. So I bought massive heat sinks with three fans and six copper heat pipes. I had to modify the mounts so they could actually fit beside each other. It was actually kind of hard to do, so I recommend buying the heat sinks that screw from top down. I think it'll be a lot easier to install. So I've got this clip in. Now on this side, I just have to press on that little hole until it clips in, just like that. Then I gotta put the fans back in, and then I can install the motherboard into the computer. All right, now the new CPUs are in there, new motherboard. Got our video card back in, an extra 500 gigabyte SSD. Let's start this up and see if we can set it up and benchmark it. All right, here's the first post. It's always the fun part. Let's see if it starts up. Looks promising. It actually turns on. Power light's working. Oh shit. And it's dead. Let's try it again. Something's coming up on the screen. It sees one CPU. Okay, let's see if we can see the CPU config. Yes, that looks pretty good. So we have CPU 2, CPU 1. Took a little bit of time to set things up. Once it's set up, it appears to be working pretty well. And let's see how many cores we got. Or 32 threads, 16 cores. That looks pretty nuts. So we should be getting 32 threads and 16 cores instead of 8 cores here. So now we got 2.7 gigahertz running 2 socket, 16 cores, 32 threads. 40 megabytes of level 3 cache. Let's run our benchmarks and see what happens. CPU Z is interesting to look at because it tells you the wattages, voltages, level 3 cache, megahertz, nanometers, all that stuff. You can pause it and check it out if you like. So I ran some benchmarks on the old AMD and the new Xeon, one of them being Cinebench R20 and some other stress tests. We're going to run the IDA trial version stress test. It's free to try. You can watch the CPUs go up in load and all the temperatures. Since we have large heat sinks, it won't thermal throttle because it's going to stay cool. The two large heat sinks, we can keep the temperatures around 65 or less. That's while the CPU is outputting 106 watts times 2, so that's 212 watts total. Here you can see the temperatures rise slowly and then plateau at around 64 degrees Celsius, or about 147 Fahrenheit. So it's probably worth it to install the larger heat sinks because it can maintain the lower temperatures and keep your CPUs running at 1.3 gigahertz. With the stress test, it runs at about 550 watts. We're going to hit stop and see what it drops down to. It's 300, 200, and then I think it should drop below 200 once everything settles down. So it idles at about 190 watts. That's pretty similar to the AMD actually. So adding that extra CPU doesn't add too much power usage to this beast. Not bad. Now we're going to run some 3D Mark and some other benchmarks and then we'll compare the scores between the old FX8350 and my new Xeon dual core system. So we just did the time spy extreme and the points did go up by over a thousand which is pretty impressive. That's 61.3% increase over the AMD CPU. If you take a look at the CPU score, we're 347% greater, 4,000 instead of 900. That is 4.5 times faster than the previous CPU. That's a considerable boost in performance. That's pretty impressive. Graphics score goes up 28%, and that translates to much smoother frames per second. So it's not a small upgrade. It actually improves your graphics performance quite a bit, just by increasing your CPU and motherboard performance. Now we're going to run Superposition. It's a pretty cool graphics test and overall system test.
This table shows you the before and after benchmark scores and the percent performance of the Xeon system on the right. Hard drive performance doesn't increase at all. Superposition performance increased by 33%. 3D Mark by 45. Rendering performance almost went up three times. The members over at the Anatech forums have created a standardized way to test your CPU. So if you want to test yours, check the link in the description. And Premiere encoding takes about a third the amount of time. And there wasn't a huge improvement to single core performance, but it did go up 41%. Multi-core score went up four times and Cinebench went up by almost 3.5 times. So pretty impressive performance boost by upgrading to the two Xeon CPUs. Here's a bar chart of the same information. This makes it easier to visualize that system performance goes up only 33%, but anything that only uses the CPU goes up quadruple. The results of CPU Z are similar to user benchmark. You can see the Xeon system performs a little bit better than the 9900KF and 3700X. So nothing's really changed in comparison to the user benchmark. Here it's funny to put the FX8350 on there. You can see how much lower in performance it is to the rest. For one and two core performance, it's actually beating the E5. And then the E5 slowly beats it for four and eight and then just dominates it for 64 core. So that's interesting to see. I guess it's not a bad single core performer. 3D Mark scores usually depend on the graphics card mostly and then a small portion on the CPU. So we only saw a performance increase of 29 to 67%. It's not like the four times improvement, but it's still pretty significant for just a CPU upgrade. Definitely worth it if you're looking for a little upgrade to your system and you already have a good graphics card. As you see on the left side, we're getting 160 frames per second and on the right side, we're only getting 103. So it's a little bit smoother. With this CPU upgrade, you can run the 144 Hertz monitors. Whereas with the old system, you wouldn't be able to keep up. Here's Apex Legends, and we're getting only a small increase in performance because it's more graphics intense. We're getting about 100 frames per second versus the old system, which was about 85. And then when we start shooting, it's only 10 or 12 frames per second faster. So a small improvement, not huge, but if you do a lot of gaming and rendering, I think it's a pretty good upgrade for 300 bucks. So I'd say for Apex Legends, it's a 19% increase, and for Battlefield 3, we got about a 43% increase, which is pretty significant. So the Xeon performs pretty well for gaming. So my concluding remarks would be that it's definitely worth it. Best bang for your buck around for CPU power, and I'm happy with the upgrade. I definitely recommend it if you can get your hands on a cheap CPU, motherboard, and RAM. I'll leave some links in the description to the kits that I recommend and the CPU heatsinks that I recommend. Since the sockets are right beside each other, you won't be able to install a heatsink like I did without modifying it, so you'll definitely want to get one that screws in from on top. It'll make your life a lot easier. Thanks for watching my video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to support me, check out my other videos and check out my Patreon page. Leave some comments and some suggestions to what videos you want to see in the future. I'll keep trying to bring you guys more content and keep it fun. Thanks for watching, and I hope that helps. It is set. We got a lurker. Help me! Oh. Did you kill it while it was jumping? Yeah, I killed it and then it jumped on me. <laughs> <laughs>